heart of the Utah desert, busted up tanks are coming back to life. During the Second World War, the M18 Hellcat was the fastest fighting machine on tracks. Without breaking a sweat, it could leave everything behind in a cloud of dust. This Hellcat is being rescued from history's junkyard for a surprise reunion with the same commander who drove it over 60 years ago. Lightning fast, almost able to come out of nowhere. This is the M18 Hellcat. During World War II, nothing was more nimble on the battlefield. If you saw one coming, it was already too late. I'm gonna tell you what's so cool about the Hellcat. It's like running around in a power boat. You can fishtail the thing, you can, you can run it around in figure eights and it just goes faster and faster and you're throwing up dirt and, and you're throwing a big cloud of dust and it's a, like a sports car and, it, and it's a real smooth ride you can go over dips and bumps it's the ultimate all-terrain vehicle the m18 hellcat is just one of almost 200 pieces at the carl smith collection in twilla utah not far from salt lake city Businessman Carl Smith is the man and the money behind the operation. Carl is a big fan of tanks. He's a huge fan of war veterans. But he's not a fan of being in front of the camera. But you're welcome to walk through what he calls his sandbox. Battle-scarred tanks don't come back to life on their own. They need a dedicated crew, radical surgery, and serious attention to detail. To make this happen, Carl has pulled together an amazing team. The man in charge of the metal makeovers is Roger Condren. He's a 30-year veteran of the restoration scene. I take something that's bent, broken, uh, destroyed, clean it up, fix it up, remanufacture it, and uh, bring it back to what it was or what it would have been. Whenever he needs backup, Roger pulls in a first-class crew. Greg Lloyd worked for over 20 years in a steel plant. At the tank workshop, his nickname is Goose. Oh, yeah. A lot of places where I go, the, the folks will ask me, they say, well, what do you, what is it that you do for a living? And I say, well, I... I uh, restore World War II vehicles, and they kind of look at me like, that's a cool job, and, and boy, I'd like to have your job. Randy Killen has created special effects magic for classic films like Jaws, Blade Runner, and Titanic. Building scale models in Hollywood was the perfect training ground for rebuilding 40-ton tanks. There's all kinds of things in movies that don't really exist in real life, so you have to come up with some kind of creative solution to something that doesn't really exist. Another key part of the tank crew is writer-historian Jeffrey Panos. These guys are very knowledgeable, but when I'm needed, I come in and I research for them, and I find the various details about the vehicles, their historical past, and any kind of nuances they want to know about. So I'm the, yeah, I'm the pet historian. And the historian has made an incredible find. Using this photograph, Jeff was able to match the serial numbers on this M18 Hellcat with the serial numbers on a Hellcat in Carl Smith's collection. And to top it off, Jeff has actually found the tank commander who drove this very same Hellcat. 
This tank was 60 years ago in Europe. It came back to the US, was rebuilt, was sent back to Bosnia, you know, came back to the US. We purchased it, came to Salt Lake, and there is a veteran here in Salt Lake that had a picture of this tank. There were 1,847 of these Hellcats made with the gun on it. And so it was one out of 1,847 Vegas odds that this could have been his Hellcat. And we believe it is, and we've been matching the serial numbers, and we think we've matched them. And almost too good to be true, the veteran is living down the highway in Salt Lake City. In a few days, Carl and his tank crew are going to reunite the commander with his Hellcat at a victory day party for veterans. This means Roger has got a big job on his hands. In the next few days, he's got to take this Hellcat and get it whipped into shape. Battle ready for a veteran who hasn't seen it in 60 years. Our Hellcat here, basically all I've really done to it in the past was we sandblasted it and painted it to make it look good so it looked OK you know, while it was sitting in line. For our party that we're going to be putting on for the vets, we need to get it running, spruced up, cleaned up inside, painted. We have to go through the engine and get the turret pulled off, make sure everything operates and works. The M18 Hellcat was not born by chance. It was designed in the heat of battle to face off against a deadly enemy. Europe, 1940. Germany unleashed the most advanced mechanized force the world had ever seen. This was the Blitzkrieg. Brutal lightning strikes across Europe that overwhelmed everything in their path. The US Army needed something to knock out this rolling thunder. So they created the M18 Hellcat. Thanks to its light armor and lightweight radial aircraft engine, the M18 was faster than anything else on tracks. Factory production on the Hellcat started in 1943. It first saw action in the blazing summer of 1944. Crews loved the M18 for its speed. They also loved its smooth ride, thanks to a state-of-the-art suspension system. The newest track-laying vehicles, such as the 76mm gun-armored carriage, employs a new system known as torsion bar suspension. The upward movement of the arm twists the torsion bar, and its resistance acts like a spring in supporting the vehicle. Long after the Hellcat was designed, the US Army's M1 Abrams still relies on a torsion bar system. The swing arms enable this 69-ton monster to travel smoothly at 45 miles per hour. But even all these years later, the Abrams is still not as fast as the M18 Hellcat. Able to cruise at about 53 miles an hour, the Hellcat's speed was legendary. And it had to be. In the final months of the war, four M18 Hellcats would play a pivotal role in one of the most important battles of the entire Second World War. Quilla, Utah just outside Salt Lake City. It's got mountains, big sky, and wide open spaces. Plus, one of the world's largest private collections of military vehicles. Now we're up to over 180 pieces, and uh, I have a lifetime job sitting right here, you know, right in front of me. When you're rebuilding tanks, you've got to deal with serious battle scars. I do have another one outside that has come off another bombing range, and it's been napalm. I mean, you know, literally burned to a crisp. It's been burned out, it's been torched, it's been everything you can imagine. I don't think even Roger can repair this. But right now, Roger's trying to get this M18 Hellcat ready for a big party honoring war veterans. 
At the party, one of the veterans is going to be reunited with this Hellcat. The same Hellcat he commanded in the Second World War. The party is only days away. When Roger first saw it, the Hellcat was a mess. They're open top, so they're rusted inside and full of twigs and branches and dust and dirt. So they were pretty dirty. Uh, a lot of times they didn't run. So I had a, a lot of stuff to start with. Some parts were completely gone. This is where Randy Killen comes in. I usually get a call. They say that they either have a part that's been rusted out or is actually missing. Uh, if it's rusted out, then we'll take it and try to get the dimensions from reference material books, or if we have a duplicate part. We measure that up, we put it into a CAD system. A lot of the parts are flat pieces of metal because that was the easiest to work with. If you can get a flat piece and weld it to another piece or bolt it to another piece, then you're a lot faster than having to mold it. So a lot of our parts are recreated with flat sheets of steel. Easiest and fastest and most accurate way for us to do that is by using steel cutting laser. We usually make what we call a soft skin or a cardboard prototype, go back and fit it on the vehicle to make sure that our measurements are correct. We bring it back, do any final changes or adjustments, and then go have it made out of steel or whatever the appropriate material is. Hellcat was a ferocious fighter in the liberation of Europe. But the armored vehicle is not exactly what it seems. The M18 is, in fact, a tank destroyer. The Hellcat is not actually a tank. It's meant to engage other tanks. It's not really meant to engage infantry or support infantry. That's why it has no coaxial gun next to the barrel, nor one in the front hull. It's strictly to kill other tanks. American tank destroyers were designed to race ahead of an enemy attack. Then, they would lie in wait to ambush oncoming panzers. The M18 was supposed to strike first and then get out fast. A kind of shoot and scoot approach to battle. Well, you were continuously using the Hellcat as a, a self-propelled gun. The armament on it with the 76 millimeter cannon was very effective, and the eyesight, the sight on it, was such that you could draw a bead on anything up to two, two and a half miles <laughs> distance. In 1944, the Hellcat's range made it a deadly force in combat. But for today's modern tanks, like the M1 Abrams, that's a mere stone's throw. At the JSMC tank facility in Lima, Ohio, this M1 Abrams is getting its sights aligned. The M1's computer-assisted main gun can knock out enemy tanks over 4,000 yards away. being surrounded by armor. The ballistic computer, uh, basically what it does, it computes any variable. We have a wind sensor, a can sensor, that that computer analyzes, and it applies that solution when you fire the round. So let's say, for example, that you were firing on the move, there's lead to be applied, right? Because you're not going to fire where you're aiming. 
So that ballistic computer applies that lead and then adds the solution for wind, camp, speed, barometric pressure, because the temperature of the round also has implications too. So that's, that's how the ballistic computer works. And it's very fast. Uh, and it's what makes the, the, the tank as lethal as it is. The M18 Hellcat was invented specifically to destroy tanks. But war transformed the Hellcat's role, and it was assigned to provide frontline support to the infantry. This Hellcat is one of the most beautiful vehicles that you could possibly imagine being in combat with. It was just a pleasure to drive them because they had such good traction and uh, speed. A very comfortable ride because it was riding like, like riding in a boat. A lot of times we were able to convoy uh, infantry on our tanks across the fields that way. Hellcat's roll change was possible because it had the shooting power to make that switch. Let me tell you about the gun on the Hellcat. It's the same gun that went on the Sherman. It's a 7.6.2 millimeter flat trajectory cannon. The, the real difference was that the tank destroyer crews were issued this hot round, this anti-tank uh, armor-piercing round, and it made the difference to knock out enemy tanks. When these high-explosive anti-tank rounds slammed into enemy tanks, they would shoot a super-hot jet of molten steel right through the armor. The Germans responded by adding a sacrificial piece of plate armor on their hulls. This extra plate would diffuse the molten jet and protect the underlying armor and the crew. Modern armies have a different kind of tank destroyer. Here, German anti-tank crews use Milan rockets to take out targets over two miles away. These rockets operate on a similar idea to the Hellcat's high explosive anti-tank rounds. But they pack a deadly extra punch. Each rocket is equipped with two warheads. The first warhead takes out the standoff armor. The second warhead penetrates the internal armor exploding into the crew compartment. These missiles are guided by wires, so their control signals can't be jammed by the enemy. A thin wire trails behind the rocket, allowing the operator to guide the missile directly to target. Packed with armor-penetrating ammunition, the Hellcat was state-of-the-art in 1944. American designers thought its speed would give the Hellcat nine lives. And sometimes, it did. It was so maneuverable, and it had such less mass to push. Even its tracks are thinner. That's less inertia for the engine to overcome and spin those tracks again and again and again. Uh, it gave it such a tremendous speed, a remarkable speed. Don Breinholt was attached to the 603rd Tank Destroyer Battalion of the 6th Armored Division. On one mission in France, he was ordered to take out enemy positions. We cut off the road and got out the field. I was the second destroyer at that time. Something prompted me to make a command. I said, Phipps, give her a hard left. And he did. He gave her a hard left. And at that same time, I saw a muzzle flash of a German gun. And I, I can still see the tracer, the smoke of the tracer as it went by. And I felt like I could reach out and touch that shell as it went by. It was that close. The maneuverability of the tank was immediately you made a left-hand turn. It didn't take but just a second. But that gunner had a dead beat on us, I know. Hellcats saw heavy fighting all the way from France into Berlin. 
No wonder some of the survivors are so battered. But in the right hands, a piece of junk can become a piece of art. Randy's duplicated the original mud flaps. Now it's time to see if they fit. How'd they come out? Uh, pretty good, I believe. Nice to double check before you, before you, before you weld that thing. Commit it to the weld. I don't want, I don't want to be cutting it back off. See if we can get her on. In battle, nothing was faster than the Hellcat. But that speed came at a tremendous price. To make the Hellcat as fast as possible, American engineers gave it a very thin hull. So thin that heavy machine gun fire could cut right through it. Unlike the Hellcat, modern tanks combine speed and protection. The M1's armor is a top secret composite of steel and ceramics. Strengthened with depleted uranium, the M1's armor is almost indestructible. We had a tank in Iraq that took 50 RPG hits, and none of them penetrated. They pulled the tank back into the assembly area, and it had, you know, RPGs darted in there like a cushion. If I could travel back in time and I had already been on an Abrams, man, it'd be culture shock. Think about the survivability of a hit. Knowing in the back of your mind that if a German tank hit you, you were going up. You didn't feel the invincibility that you would have today. With the Hellcat, American tank designers sacrificed protection for speed. But that speed could mean the difference between life and death. In the middle of winter, up against a huge German offensive, the lightning-fast Hellcat would save the day and help win one of the biggest battles of the Second World War. Twila, Utah. In a few days, U.S. veterans will gather here to be honored by collector Carl Smith and his tank crew. Roger Condren has to get this M18 Hellcat ready for inspection by the same man who was its commander during World War II. No matter how difficult to track down a repair, the tiny details are critical to get a first-class restoration. I'll bead blast everything when I tape off the glass. I'll paint it and redo my numbers, uh, replace some of the gauges, and uh, it'll probably look real close to brand new when I'm done. The main difficulty in trying to restore all this stuff is getting a lot of the little detail items. The major components are fairly easily obtainable. You're uh, just about stuck with what you have, and luckily, a lot of times, stuff is really good get a lot of satisfaction because I can make this dash look just like brand new almost. And it's something that people really notice. The paint on the tank doesn't really matter. But when they look inside and see all these nice little red circuit breakers and see all the little arrows and, and what it's for, people are a lot more impressed by something that has contrast to it instead of just green. To get this Hellcat in driving condition, Roger Condren has to borrow the engine from the collection's other Hellcat. <laughs> Fixing up the Hellcat highlights a life-saving design feature. It's only 60 years old or so. You don't always win a war with the biggest gun or the toughest tank. Sometimes, it's all about who gets back into action first. On the Hellcat, one of the nice features it did have was the ease of maintenance. It had a tailgate that dropped down in the back. So after about 20 minutes, 
you know, a couple guys, you could have the engine all undone and ready to pull out. You could change an oil pump, you know, oil lines, anything underneath that engine, you know, very quickly. So maintenance on a Hellcat was extremely easy. Okay, there we go. Rapid field repair gave the Allies an edge when they came face to face with superior German technology. Remember, you're never fixing a tank in a place like this. You're fixing it in the mud, you're fixing it in the snow, you're fixing it under fire. If you can create a tank that any farm boy or city kid can fix reliably and get it back into action, it's going to save his life and it's going to win you a war. Modern tank designers use the same principles of rapid field repair. The M1 Abrams power pack design is light years ahead of its World War II ancestors. Now, even the most sophisticated tank can be put back into battle in a matter of minutes. If I need to replace an engine or pull an engine pack from the tank, I can do it in approximately 30 minutes with a good trained maintenance crew. But even with all this smart design, basic maintenance is still a constant issue for any tank crew. I spend about 75% of my time devoted to maintenance. It takes a lot of man hours to keep these tanks running and operational. But if you don't have your tanks running, then tanks can't get into the fight to help out the infantry. There we go. Roger only has a few days to get the M18 ready for the party. Okay. Easy access to the engine makes a big difference. The M18's engine is designed to slide on tracks for easy access. Originally built for airplanes, the Hellcat's engine was air-cooled. The engines in the Hellcat are rather interesting. They are an aircraft radial. You don't have to mess with antifreeze and water and radiators getting shot out, you know, and leaking fluids. But when it came to crew comfort in wintertime, the M18's engine was no friend. Any winter battle in a Hellcat is like fighting inside of a refrigerator. That fan is really sucking a lot of air. So whenever that engine's running, it's drawing outside air in through all the open hatches. And it can be very cold in the wintertime. Don Breinholt commanded a Hellcat during the Second World War. There was snow on the ground, and it was cold. It was down to, I'd say, zero, or maybe below. I don't know. It was mighty cold to stay in there. And of course, we, our, our home was a, our M18. And a lot of times, we would prefer to take our sleeping bag and sleep on the ground rather than stay inside the cold tank. It's really awful because unlike an infantryman who can kind of squirm and move around or move from here to here and, and maintain some body warmth, you're sitting in a cage of really cold steel and you've got to concentrate and you've got to make sure that enemy doesn't get you and you've got to kill him first. freezing tanks, Hellcat crews engaged in one of the most decisive battles of the entire war. December 1944, pushed to the brink, desperate, Germany launched a massive counteroffensive. Taken by surprise, Allied lines were broken and pushed back. This was the Battle of the Bulge fought in the dead of winter, stretching out over 85 miles through Belgium and Luxembourg. This was the largest land battle ever fought by the US Army. For the German offensive to succeed, speed was essential. They have just days to reach the port of Antwerp and seize Allied fuel depots before they run out of gas. This means they have to dominate and control the roads. The Battle of the Bulge, at least initially, it was a battle for the roads and the crossroads. 
then it was necessary to take the crossroads. And Bastogne is a very important road junction because you have there seven roads crossing in Bastogne. Bastogne was known as the place where seven roads to hell met and crossed. Four M18 Hellcats would face a do or die moment in the war. Would they be able to beat back the German onslaught and hold their line? In the Utah desert, an M18 Hellcat tank destroyer is getting ready for a party. But it needs a new engine. Roger Condren has salvaged the engine from the collection's other Hellcat. A little bit to your left. Now, he's got to make sure it's going to run. OK, that's good. Ready again? Yeah, we're ready to go. Let's see if we can get her in. OK, here we go. Even though this Hellcat is easy to repair, the crew still needs to finesse the engine's fit. Can I help? Yep. Roger tries to connect the drive shaft to the engine output shaft. Because it's pretty solid. Where's that real easy button when you need it? <laughs> All right. It wants to come it's back a little. It's lined up. OK, let's try it. Oh, there it goes. Hey, there we are, guys. We're in. Starting up a Hellcat is easier said than done. This is a World War II tank destroyer. You don't just insert your key and turn on the ignition. What we have to do, you know, to get the Hellcat started, or basically any radial engine tank started, is a very critical part of the maintenance and procedure on getting the thing running. You pull your hand crank out, you know, crank the engine over 50 times. What you're doing is clearing the cylinders out of oil, uh, possibly gasoline, anything else that might have gotten in there. Once that is completed, you turn your fuel valve on so you can get your fuel going. You will then turn on your master power switch so you have power to the starter and all your gauges. Playing it safe, Roger has a fire extinguisher close at hand. If there's any gas in there, as soon as it fires, flames will come out. So anytime you start up a radial engine, you know, you need to be wary of you know, fuel fires. Rather be safe than sorry. Shall we hit it? Okay. This is a big moment for Roger and the whole team. Will the replacement engine actually work? Later, the Hellcat doesn't let the crew down. The tank destroyer is ready for action. Boy, that was sweet. That was. Everything looks good back here. Right. Yeah, that looks good. Wish they all started like this. All right. Yeah, I like it when it does that. That was an excellent feeling. You know, seeing that baby start up. You know, the smoke coming out. Uh, a little bit of oil coming out. Uh, just the rumble of the engine. Well, let me turn the fuel off. You know, and uh, we can finish buttoning her up. feel it moving for the first time was a 
feeling that it's really hard to describe, like getting your first car when you're 16. Just what a feeling it is to all of a sudden be driving something for the first time. Just an incredible feeling. Cat's noise and smoke are a small reminder of a tanker's life during the heat and fury of war. It was extremely noisy, it was smelly, uh, gasoline, motor oil, gunpowder, body odor, urine, you smelled it all. And it was grueling. And you'd be fighting for hours and hours, and you're constantly worrying about your ammunition supply. You're constantly worrying about enemy troops and Panzerfausts. You're constantly trying to maintain contact with your own forces, and you're looking through a little tiny periscope. It seems all too small when you're in battle. And you're trying to locate the enemy. You're trying to fight him. You're trying to maintain your sense of direction and your sense of purpose and fight back. When the Hellcat was moving through battle, the crew had a unique angle on the action. Hellcat tank commanders surveyed the ground from an open turret. In armored combat, he who sees the other enemy first has a much greater chance of shooting at them and hitting them. The open top to the tank destroyer allowed the crew to see out and see the enemy tank and fire and hit it. I'm sure that uh, everyone who was in a position sometimes thought, well, here I am like a sitting duck up here. Some sniper could sure pick you off easy that way. I feel very fortunate to have gone all the way from Uma Beach, clear to we met the Russians in an exposed position. I was the gunner for the first week, and then from then on as a gun commander up in that position there. Hellcat commanders fought the war from a dangerously exposed position. The M1 Abrams employs a design feature to keep its crews protected at all times. It's called the Common Remote Operating System or CROWS. The CROWS system is a remote weapon station which the tank commander can fire from inside the turret. And what these systems are designed to do is to keep the crews inside the turret of the tank so that they are not exposed to enemy fire. And it allows the crew to survive in urban environments along with being very lethal. Hellcats were an open window on the battlefield. When it comes to sighting and tracking today's enemy targets, the M1 gives the crew a whole new set of eyes. The most impressive function or piece of equipment on this tank to me is the CITV. The commander's independent thermal viewer uh, enables us to pretty much identify more targets than one. Um, I can be looking off to the left side while the gun's looking off to the right side. And as soon as I see something, I can designate the gun to what I'm looking at. Uh, also, I have thermal imaging, and that picture is just so much better than what the gunner's looking at. Uh, you can zoom in and out, and uh, it's just more easily controlled. If I was the enemy, you know, if I saw a formation of Abrams tanks coming at me, you know, I'd turn and run. When you get on top of it and you're going 30 miles an hour and you're firing on the move, uh, you feel invincible. December 1944, the Battle of the Bulge is thundering through Belgium. The Germans are desperate to move as far as possible, as quickly as possible. Outside the small town of Neuville, German panzers close in. But four Hellcats are standing in the way. In the face of overwhelming odds, the M-18s stop the German advance.
Thinking Nobile is held by a sizable Allied force, the German commander pulls back to regroup. His mistake will cost several days, days the German army could not afford. That critical delay allowed the Allies to move in reinforcements. They were able to hold the strategic town of Bastogne, just south of Noville, thanks in part to the M18 Hellcat. I think that they, they played a very important part uh, in Noville. Among the 25 uh, German tanks destroyed in Noville, probably most of them were destroyed by the tank destroyers. shot. What do I say? It's, uh, everything worked. My fuel cutoff switch worked. Everything. You know. it goes a lot faster than I thought it would go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, wait till I get in the third. That's 30 to 60. Roger and Goose have the Hellcat running, but there's still one problem left, and it's a big one. The turret still has to be fitted, and with the party just days away, time is about to run out. Twilla, Utah. Roger Condren and Greg Lloyd are getting ready to put the finishing touches on this M18 Hellcat. Okay, straight now. For one okay. veteran at the upcoming party, it's going to be a once in a lifetime surprise. Keep going, come on in. Tilt forward just a little bit. But one last piece has to be fitted before the Hellcat is ready. And it's a massive piece, the turret. We're there. This okay. turret weighs roughly 5,000 pounds. The diameter spans about 68 inches. A perfect fit is absolutely critical. No one can afford to make any mistakes right now. They spent too much time making this Hellcat look like it just rolled off the factory floor. Okay, she's down. I think we got it. Good. Good That's deal. great. That's great. Okay, thanks, Goose. Roger and Goose may have the Hellcat's turret back on, but will it work? All these years later, the Hellcat doesn't disappoint. Once again, it's battle ready. For most of these tanks, their stories will remain forever buried on the battlefield. But every now and then, a small clue can suddenly rise to the surface. This is the turret from another tank getting prepped for a paint job. Okay, Brad, that, that looks pretty nice. Well, that's got it just about where I need it. And you've got a uh, little bit of green paint, a little bit of primer, but that's, that's just fine. That'll, that won't hurt. There's no rust left on it. Never find out the history on this particular turret. Sometimes we do. Yeah. Oh, well. When it comes to buried history, the serial numbers can unlock the past. Yeah. Oh, what's that? Look at that. There are some numbers on there that weren't on there, but I, I don't know what they are. Roger and his crew made a similar discovery with their Hellcat. On our tanks here, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're not. On our Hellcat, we were able to, you know, figure out what our manufacturer's serial number was. At that point, Jeff Panos used the serial numbers to track down the Hellcat's history. Unbelievably, Jeff discovered that the Hellcat in the collection was actually driven by a retired veteran living just a few miles away in Salt Lake City. We have a 
man here in, in Salt Lake City in Utah who happened to command Hellcats and all through the Battle of the Bulge and for, all the way from Normandy to Germany. Just hearing the news, I mean, it ran chills up my spine. Just mind boggling that, you know, we have something that he actually had his hands on personally in 1945. That tank commander was Don Breinholt. As Don and the other veterans arrive for the party, Roger's crew is about to make a dream come true. The last I saw one was in the, uh, in May, May, about May 20th or something like that. Of 1945. 1945. Okay. <laughs> so that would be 61, 61 years ago. <laughs> Good grief. And so we want to show you something here. We opened up the garage, and there was the Hellcat. Hey. And he was overwhelmed. <laughs> oh, man, what a, what a beauty that is. You know, that, that gave me a lot of thought. I never even dreamt of ever seeing an M18 Hellcat again. It was a beautiful vehicle, and I was often, often wondered what happened to all those M18 Hellcats. It's amazing after 61 years. <laughs> Thank you. How would you like to take a ride in one again? <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> and the most amazing thing about Earl Breinholt was he walked right up to that Hellcat. And he says, this is how you get into a Hellcat. And at the age of 87 years old, he put his foot right on the bogey. He grabbed the proper handhold, and he climbed right up into the turret. He was riding around, and he came back, and we asked him, what do you think? And he pounded the top of the turret, yelling, faster, faster. So Roger took him around again, going faster and faster. He was delighted, and his wife told me he, she'd never seen a, a, a grin on his face that, that wide in maybe 20 years. That, that was something else. It was a, fun, a familiar feeling for sure. Uh, I just really enjoyed it. We had a good driver too. <laughs> that brings back a lot of memories. It brings back a lot of memories. This machine gun ring here is, was my place in combat. This is how much I was exposed all the time in combat. And of course, we duck it down a lot of times too, but, but I was exposed to a lot of fire. And sure, sure, it makes you duck down when you start hear, hearing bullets, shells coming over the top of you. Because they, they make a crack, they make a pop sound as they go by you. <laughs> One M18 Hellcat tank destroyer brought back to life. One tank commander reunited with his tank. Mission accomplished. Now it's time to say thank you to the men and women who fought for freedom on a distant battlefield. These were young, brave, courageous men. Uh, they knew the world was at war. They knew they had no choice. I have the highest regard for these men. When the party's over, the tank crew will get back to their passion, saving these war machines from history's salvage yard. And this is one mission they hope never ends. In a job like this, there probably is no retirement. You know, for something you really, truly love, there is no retirement. Ah!